Okay, this video segment is going to be about fusion and how that compares to fission and then what we know currently about doing fusion uh, basically on our planet. So uh, we'll start with a little video on what nuclear fusion is. Finding energy per nucleon increases up to a mass of about 56. Smaller nuclei can become more stable by fusing with other small nuclei. Two naturally occurring deuterium atoms can fuse to form helium-3 and one neutron. A large amount of energy is given off in the reaction. One tritium nucleus and one deuterium nucleus can fuse to form helium-4 and one neutron. The second reaction is favored for experimental nuclear fusion reactions because less energy in the form of heat is required to initiate fusion. Okay, so it's a little video clip, just kind of idea of what happens. When we're do, dealing with fission and fusion, the difference between the two is that at iron, basically iron 56, that's your break point. So anything smaller than iron 56 can be fused. Anything bigger than iron 56 has to undergo fission if you want to change it in terms of a nuclear reaction. So typically on our planet, we're working with deuterium and tritium, the two different isotopes of hydrogen, and trying to get them to fuse because they are the easiest to make happen and they are the ones that take the least amount of heat or the least amount of temperature to make them happen. Now what fusion really is, is you're taking two small nuclei that are maybe not super stable and then combine them together to make a more stable um, nucleus. So if you look, deuterium and tritium, they're not very stable isotopes of hydrogen. So because they're relatively unstable, they're willing or easier to move into a different um, element. So by combining the two together at super high temperature, we can make helium, which is a really stable uh, noble gas, and we get, a, get an extra neutron out of that. Um, the beauty of fusion is there's no radioactive waste. So this is a stable isotope of helium, and um, there's, this would be completely safe for us. So um, the idea is fusion gives us all the power of fission, but none of the waste. So it's kind of like this holy grail of, um, of energy sources, if we can get it to work. Now the problem is, the temperature at which you need to be at to get fusion to happen are like 300 million degrees Celsius or higher. So for us to do it on our planet right now in, with man-made technology is really unrealistic. We can do it. We have reactors that do it. Uh, one of them is a tokamak reactor down here. But the reality is none of them do it efficiently enough or none of them do it with a cost efficiency that allows us to actually build them into a power plant. So right now it's more research-based stuff. It's more you know entry-level. Let's see if we can make this happen. Um, but there is a future, so there's possible that, you know, 100 years, 200 years, 10 years, 5 years, who knows, um, we'll have a reactor that can produce power using fusion. Now, um, we do want to talk about solar fusion because the, the fuel source for all our stars and our sun is fusion. Um, within the core of the sun, the temperatures there are much higher than needed, so they basically use this idea of fusing hydrogen. They actually go up higher than that. They'll fuse hydrogen, they'll fuse helium, they'll fuse beryllium. Um, within the core of our sun, we can actually fuse much bigger atoms together uh, in that process. Um, besides fusion reactors, which we work on, we do have fusion bombs, okay, or fusion uh, atomic weaponry. Uh, we call those the H-bombs. Now, what an H-bomb is, basically... Uh, it's a set of tritium, deuterium, or hydrogen in the core, and then around that they actually put a fission bomb or an atomic bomb. That atomic bomb, when it explodes, creates enough pressure and temperature at the core to then cause a fusion reaction. And just like fission, if we don't control it, that fusion reaction runs as a chain reaction, and it um, can re release you know a lot of energy and that's something that can be very devastating is if we have these hydrogen bombs, okay? So fission is splitting, fusion is combining the two. Fusion is not something that we can do really well on our planet yet. It's very much in the infancy stages of researching and trying to get it to happen. Fission technology is pretty well developed, um, but our biggest drawback with fission is this idea of dealing with the nuclear waste between those two things. Okay, If you're interested, look up the tokamak reactor. Uh, there's some information out there on it and how that basically uh, is able to generate some fusion here on our planet. Now, last thing we want to talk about are quarks. Um, within all of this, we talked about moving protons and, and neutrons around, and we spend a lot of time talking about those protons and neutrons. The reality is that quarks actually are the building blocks of neutrons and protons, so they're not a fundamental particle. So a neutron isn't um, 
the smallest thing we can get. Within that, we do have these quarks. We have six types. Uh, they call them the up and down quark, the charm and strange, and the top and bottom. And we group them in three sets because these are kind of counterpart quarks that kind of exchange information between the two. Uh, of these six, the up and down quarks are the only ones that are stable in our universe, which means they're the only ones that stick around. Charmed and strange, top and bottom, as soon as we can generate them through a particle accelerator, they decay back into energy almost instantly. So we know they exist, but we really don't have much information besides that on because they don't last. They don't stick around for us to research them. The up and down quarks stay. To make a neutron, you use two down quarks and one up. To make a proton, it's two up and one down. Now, quarks have an interesting amount of charge to them. Uh, the up quarks are two-thirds of a charge, and a down quark is a negative third. So if we do the math on a neutron, if we have a negative third and a negative third for our two down quarks, that's a negative two-thirds. Well, the up is a positive two-thirds, so negative two-thirds and positive two-thirds equals zero. So that's why the neutron is neutral, because the quarks actually cancel their charges out. However, in the proton, having two up quarks and one down quark, you have a positive two-thirds worth of charge, a positive two-thirds worth, so you have a positive four-thirds minus one-third, that gives us a plus one. So when these charges are added up, you end up being a positive one or a plus one charge with a proton. Okay. So these quarks are what allow us to switch from neutrons to protons or protons into neutrons, because all we have to do is rearrange the number of quarks within these protons and neutrons. It's really no different than rearranging the number of neutrons and protons inside a nucleus. Um, you know, quarks can be moved in and moved out just like they can uh, in a nucleus or protons and neutrons. So, um, quarks are kind of interesting. They're pretty new in terms of the research. Uh, the top quark was the last one found, and that was found, I believe, in the early 90s. Uh, I believe they published their research on that in like 1995. So, um, this idea of quarks and those building blocks is pretty relevant and pretty new technology. I know it's 20 some years ago still in terms of our timeline now. Um, but in the world of science and that kind of stuff, 20 years ago is pretty fresh because most of the stuff we talk about in class is 100 plus years um, old in terms of what we've learned. So this is one of the newer things that we talk about in our class. Um, all right, guys, that is uh, everything we have in this unit. Of course, this is our abridged unit. This is our shortened version of that for the timeline we had this year. So we're going to end the video clip now. Uh, thank you.